All right, morning, everyone. Welcome to the next installment of the JKMRC Friday morning seminar series that take place here at the Indoor Lecture Theater and online. My name is Katerina. I have a very croaky voice this morning, but I'm one of the co-chairs of the seminar series. And, um, and um, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, would like to respectfully acknowledge all traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we all meet today. Their respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Our speaker today is Malcolm Powell, who is the Emeritus Professor here at the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Malcolm is also the owner and Chief Technical Officer of several businesses such as Liner Design Services, Communication Reimagined, TTI, and GeoPRO. During 35 years at MinTech, University of Cape Town, and then as Professor of Communication here at JKMRC, Malcolm has applied fundamental communication research with a blend of applied site research consulting design software and model development to design and improve the processes on over 60 mines worldwide. His work is published in over 200 papers and conference proceedings. And Malcolm founded the Global Communication Collaborative supporting um, the research vision of integrated total process simulation as a tool for innovation. Malcolm's current research remains active through both universities and his companies, where he is applying advanced modeling techniques and knowledge of fracture to the development of new highly energy efficient processes enhancing production while lowering environmental impact. Today's presentation is promising to be both entertaining and interactive. Um, and Malcolm is speaking on sewing the sequined waistcoat. Please. <laughs> Sorry. Not sharing the screen. Okay. Presentations. Yes, so some technical picture. Sharing now. Yeah. Actually, that mini will disappear at some point. But some slight technical hitch and getting the connections going. But welcome to the small crowd here. I see there's at least double or triple the number out there. So I'm talking to the camera here, not to you guys. You just the side chat. So, um, the, the title is a bit strange, maybe. But it is inspired, here as I put, is my great friend and colleague, Dee. And uh, the, I'd got to know Dee for a while at University of Cape Town. We came from separate departments. We ended up together in chemistry and mineral processing. And at an IMPC dinner, we both appeared in this process. It wasn't very nice child to be going because he did it. That was later. And uh, she, at that moment, she said, we're connected. It's like we really had this close connection. If you knew her and I together, you would have known that. And these thought processes have been inspired. One of the people who's inspired me on this journey, and I hope I can spread that inspiration today. And uh, so the hence the saying the secret waistcoat and the sequins I'll come to of how they link through through the story. Okay. This is a Poem we start, you can't see because the heading is sitting on the screen. Can we get rid of this heading? Do you think it's sitting at the top? So, there I wrote this. I'm in a group which is hosted by Oz Minerals, and it's, um, it's thinking and acting differently, it's looking for completely new ways of addressing the future. So, a few of the group are definitely out there in the web, web world, and some of the many here, which is great to see you here. And we're really pushing the boundaries around uh, development of new concepts going forward. And uh, they asked us to wear the think and act differently, cap and pose with it. And those who know me 
No, I can't do things in half measure. I did them three and a half measure. So I went down and wrote this, this uh, poem. And I wrote this poem, went down to my garden to kind of demonstrate it. And I'm not sure that how well people can read it. So I'm just going to step out here to read it to make sure you know what it says. So the flower is in memory of a wonderfully inspirational leader in mineral processing, Professor D. Bradshaw. She coined the phrase living gold for the many students and young people she mentored, nurtured and uplifted in her life. The bowl I scooped the sand from symbolizes creativity and family made by my mother-in-law. The tanned our shirt is handmade with a friend, fun, friendship and color. The rock is a chunk of pure mineral, the value of our resources. There's also a small wooden bowl of minerals, richness of our natural resources. I'm pouring with a heart-shaped spoon to symbolize care. The fine sand product is cascading into a hand-woven African basket, symbolizing community. The setting is my lovingly nurtured, restored indigenous forest. And the reason I've started with this after D is that's how I live my life. So it's an integrated life. It's, the purpose is there. I don't come to work to do a job and go home and do something else. My purpose is really integrated. And I guess that's the intro to the story I'm going to tell. And the board is no longer working. I've started my keyboard. Let's see. I might just have to re wake this up. I don't know. Let's see if that's. Thank you. Yep. Keyboard's back on. So the living gold was what Dee spoke about. These are my words, not, not hers. But um, underpinning all this, and we're sitting in a university environment and developing people, and I believe deeply in the people. And when I think back on my career, and I'm thinking forward in my career, I'm only partway through. I don't think I'm coming to the end. I'm just warming up. And uh, is when I think of the most magic, wonderful things in my career, it's been the people who've passed uh, through my hands with me, who have evolved, who are going to be the next leaders. They are collaborators. They are change makers. I was sort of wondering if the UQ marketing was getting to me. I thought that's a UQ phrase. Yeah, it's slowly penetrated. So that's what I really care about, and that's who's going to take us on this journey. I'll be just guarding it up. And you know, the concept of opening the door to to capability. And that's what I want to see us nurturing here. And I think we've fallen behind the problems as a research community. I'm not actually pointing at SMI or JK. It's we as researchers. A lot of what I'm doing today is about researchers and interaction with industry. So both sides of the, of the community there. And really, we want the people to develop who will be out there. Um, hopefully, David Siemens logged in right now. He came through UCT, JK, Root, high up in industry. You know, these are the people that are looking to the future who are funding this work. You can see the connection. So the sequence. So those shiny little things. So I've got the lovely sequence tie of obscene beauty and inspired by this. But the sequence reflects those lovely shiny things. And boy, as researchers do like little shiny things. And there's an idea. I, I know how to get a little bit more out of this mineral in this photo. So you're like you're doing it. You're deep in it. You've done a PhD on it. It's wonderful to have done that. And it's still wonderful to do that. I'm not even putting that down. The problem is bringing the sequence together. These sequins are floating in the air. So they are um, oops, they're getting dissipated rather than brought together. And we have a bit of a problem that in academic society, there's more promotion of keep your stuff to yourself. Make sure you do well and you publish it in your name. Keep it to your heart, unfortunately, which is exactly the opposite of what academia should be. And it, it's embedded in the way of funding and promotion. You've got to be the super scientist with X publication to get ARC funding. It's actually taking away the beautiful young talent, can't get through the door. So this concept that 
we've got our little sequins and we're hanging on to them, we fit around and grab them. So, and then we don't want to make sure that, we want to make sure they're not pinched, too much of a focus on that. So what I really see is, do we have a place of value to sparse them? Do we have a way to much to sew them together rather than being a wonderful idea of floating on its own? And that's where the sequence comes from. So, the actual theme I'm going to take through here is sort of now thinking upon the future of money and within the society. Don't forget that. That's part of our environment and as a key to our future. In pursuit of the greater creative purpose of research, don't forget that. That's what keeps me coming to work or going wherever I go in the world. It's creative. You might have noticed I'm creative. And I, research is intrinsically creative. And it's a journey of an expanding mind. I'm still on that journey, a long way going on. It's very exciting to be honest. So that's where we want to go. Where's the future? Now you get to use the bits of paper. So those out on Zoom World, I forgot to explain to you, if you're in Zoom World, you need to have three pieces of paper. And you can also use the chat. So you can put stuff in the chat so we can actually get it later. Is you guys have a little square piece of paper and you hope you picked up a pen if you haven't rushed down and get one. This is the preconceived notion. It doesn't have to be your own. It's something in the research or the industry, or you can put a couple down, you can grab some more paper, or Murray, maybe get some more paper. By the way, this is Murray, my son, who has my dress sent. Um, and you, what's the preconceived notions you think we should not carry forward for, with us into the future? This is the bin of preconceived notions. If we shan't read, we shall just throw them in the bin. Okay? So if you're getting down to preconceived notions, I'm hoping there's some with the 50 or 60 out there writing the preconceived notions. I have mine, but I'm not putting my preconceived notions in front of you because I don't want to bias it. So preconceived notions, crumple the ball and throw it down. You're allowed to throw in this lecture here, so you will. And while you're thinking about that, I'm just going to put some, some future perspective up that might influence what you're thinking about. And that's the future risks. You can see I like dragons. Okay. Um, that's the future risks. So the dragons have the, the beauty and the danger, and the evil and the wonderment in them. So what are the future risks in mining that I think are, we should have in our minds when we think about what we're not going to, is not going to be useful going forward? And this is on purpose in the flame of the the climate change summit that's just happened last year. It's been winding up through this with the climate change and we've got protesters who insist that flooded this year because Scott Morrison didn't pass a law last year and things like that. So there's lots of weird drivers out there, but this is real. This is really happening in society. And the mining companies have to be on board. They're all making statements by 2050, they're gonna be net zero. So what's the cost? Could be absolutely unbearable. Because if you do it through offsets, one, you don't actually achieve anything, which really pisses me off. Because if you're gonna do something, let's do something real. And that's really a message I want. Let's do something real, not an accounting job, okay? And that's the risk now. Millions is gonna be spent on accounting jobs and planting bottles and gums in the middle of the desert for no particular purpose. Let's make sure we make this real, but they actually do get it. This is real. Can this be a real time? And the consumption uh, of energy is growing with the depth, the grade, and the demand. We all know that. So energy consumption is actually going up. And we're saying there's a target of net zero. Don't worry, we'll get there. 20 years ago, Neville, you would have been there when companies are saying, oh, we'll be down 50% of our energy in about 2005 to 2005. No, no, they double the energy. Everyone just went a bit quiet after three years of marketing and disappeared. I don't want to be back in that cycle. It just really moves me. So this is a burning pattern. It's to slash real energy input and conversion to renewable resources or alternative resources. I think we actually finally have a platform that is literally burning around the feet of the industry. Just
Uh, it's fallen down. Okay. Right. So is that clearer to the Zoom world? I hope. Sorry if that disappeared, but that's the burning platform. So we must have that in mind. What's if it's not going to help us get on that platform? Why are we carrying it with us? And the energy which is intrinsically linked to that. So my good friends in Energy Flex are explaining to me when you've got variable energy input and renewables, your problem is at night, of course, especially in Australia, because our primary renewable is the sun, is solar. So we are projecting 20 times routinely the cost of energy at night. And multiple days of the year or periods, 100 times, 200 times the day price. So we're talking hundreds of dollars per megawatt hour, um, or thousands, sorry. So instead of 10, it'll be 1,000. So, and there's containment. It just won't be available. Your mills will just stop. Your, your float plant will just stop. You've now got the electric fleet that Mining 3 is developing. It just stops. There's no energy to drive it. So that's another thing. We're going away from diesel, and we're all electric, our fleet and everything. When our electricity stops, everything stops in the mine. Okay. So this is going to hit continuous operation. And with that consumption growing and a, the energy growing demand, where are we going to be? So saving a little bit of energy in, in milling and flotation and uh, classification ain't going to cut it. And the, the water, the availability, the access, the competition, the cost. The cost is almost nothing in the industry for water until you don't have water and then you've got no production. And then that's a huge cost because it's a loss. So that's really the highlight around water. And then the waste we're acutely aware of and we're aware of in this institute is that going from tailing stands are likely to be banned. And I don't think that would be a contentious statement these days. You won't get a license if you're proposing to put a billion cubic meter tailing stam somewhere in, in, a, in a valley. So we won't get the license. How are we going to mine a, an ore body when we intend to put millions of cubic meters into a tailing sand? And it has to be completely clean, discharge water, zero acid mine drainage, other contaminants coming out of the water streams, long-term term stability, whatever we put up there. Okay, And then we have to re-landscape it and regenerate the landscape. Now, the process I've seen so far is, well, we've got what we've got and we'll see if we can fix it. That ain't going to cut it. You actually change what you put into the environment, what you, what's the end product of the mine. And then the social, deliberately under the art, we're under the spotlight. The mining industry is really under the, the beady eye of, of the public. And it's interesting because our opponents are also our clients and our consumers. It's the same people. The one who's shouting at you is holding the mobile phone and getting in their Tesla to drive home. 100% dependence on the mining industry. And it's, it's kind of ironic, but we can change people from being our foes to our, our supporters if we understand the circle or can support the circle. So really, the other side is this economic benefit locally and regionally. We know the industry is, is really thrashed for good reason for coming in, taking what they can and moving out. And that's a societal governmental issue as well. When a mine comes along and just ends, it's disastrous for an area. What if we can spread the mine life out to 50, 70, 100 years? Big company in the middle, society on either end of it. So you can really get a long-term benefit regionally and locally. So let's throw down the bits of paper. I've got to tell you to throw the paper down because you're really on to the next toss. So crumple them up, throw them down. What's your throw like? Whoa, that's amazing. <laughs> One hit, come on. Neville wins. <laughs> Longest distance throw. Okay, you get the shiny braces for the longest distance accurate throw. <laughs> right, so the next one is the gems you want to keep. So I did that little interlude just to give, that's my focus. You'll have your own thoughts. So one thing to be aware of, is these are just Malcolm's thoughts. You have lots more. So what are the gems we want to keep? And these, by the way, are from Kanchansi mine in, in Zambia. And you should see some interesting rocks there that you would really like to keep in the process and some you wouldn't. So that's your little nice flower or prettily cut piece of paper. 
is to write on that. I haven't figured how to get it to the front. We'll have to pass it down or Mario will fetch them because we're going to keep those and put them on the board. And you, can have, you might want multiple gems. What should we carry forward for us to call it all the way to 2050? What is the technology, uh, the concepts, the modeling, what the pieces of equipment? What should we keep? We really don't want to get rid of. So whatever the future holds, these are good things. So what's on your mind for that? You're all looking blank. There must be something you like. <laughs> relevant to the topic and those out in the zoom world as well thanks Yusha. so those out in the zoom world what what is on your mind that you think is amazing is it a simulator you've built is it a particular way of, of modeling a process is it a piece of equipment that's going to last for 100 years it's going to be it's going to take over from the ball mill and we'll still be using it in 50 100 years time what is it that you think we really should be keeping regardless of how we move forward in the industry. In other words, it's lasting. It's not transient. Guys are struggling. Come on, should... I had a list of 17. <laughs> <laughs> but I had more time to think about it, of course. We got something online, getting people to look at problems together through a systems lens. Yeah. So, okay. Neville's going to shoot himself in the head. So the systems-based thinking, absolutely. Do you want to whip around the two of you and get some pieces of paper? So small flaw in my method today was I didn't know how to get those done. The rest we sorted. <laughs> so while um, Shuja and Murray collect the pieces of paper. Let's go on to on to things that aren't going so well. So this is the, the evil dragon. This is the dragon we should be avoiding. This is the one we should escape from. These are the things that are worrying me. And again, it's completely Malcolm's ideas, concerns I've had over the years. And it's not pointing to anyone or anywhere in particular. But um, having a long experience of this, I think we really are pushed and there's industry, government methods, uh, institutional structures pushing us around. And almost the, the more successful you are, the more pressure there is to do something that someone else wants you to do. And I'm not saying this because I'm successful, but I, man, have I experienced that for 35 years in the industry. Someone else trying to push the idea down my throat and saying, this is what you should be doing. This is what you need to do. And we really suffer from that. And it throttles, we're getting throttled by the very institutes that should be supporting us. Not necessarily intentionally, but that we have to really have to escape from. And... Um, are we fine tuning our nice diesel Prado engine? Man, we are. And we're doing it in this institute as well. I will point a finger back here. We are doing it here. We're doing it every institute I know. So I think of John Ralston with the surface chemistry. I could never figure out how to use this stuff, but it's going to be really useful in 2030. Like I really like Lisa's group here with the surface chemistry. It's really cutting to the that's fundamental. That's, that's the particle we're dealing with. What's on the surface, that's how we capture it. That's what I want to see happening because that is the future. Not an empirical relationship between recovery and some stuff I threw in the cell. That ain't the future. Okay. So let's not retune our diesel car. Okay. It, we should not be there. We're a research team. We're moving forward. Okay. And I've written some here that's maybe a bit confrontational, but I have been in rooms where they're just making a decision, a whole mine on a few samples and a P80. And there are two problems. One is the P80 for comminution, is that the right number? Well, no. Is that the right number for recovery? No, at least you can be sure they're both wrong. It's the only thing I'm thinking when I'm sitting in the room. And it's still happening. I'm like, I don't get it. We're using computers to just do slide real calculations a billion times a second. No, man, this is not right. We need to move on from that. So, 
So we, the trouble with a sequence problem, sparky sequence, is we're fragmenting our research. We're not drawing it in together enough. And it's this, I'm in this research group or that research group, and we're not really sharing well, and we're trying to get our publication count up, and we have a secret bit of here that's going to be a, an RP in the future. But, um, and they, what's frustrating is those little gems, our gems, they have great merit, but they never make it out there. They're not changing the industry. Where's the 1% increment? You know, if you add them all up, we'd be a thousand times better production. Um, so let's look at within that total framework. Where does this fit in? Where does the sequence fit in? Is it actually going to be useful in the future? I don't want to polish the sequence for the past. I want the sequence for the future. So where are we going to fit in there? So let's look forward to a future that really is tangible. Microphone uh, falling down here. We need better take. Right. And this is the losing our sequence. So the lack of ability to transfer our insights. Um, so what are the the link between what we do and the reality? So you know, all these frayed, this is an old frayed waistcoat. This is 30 years old, not too bad, I did wash it. But are we losing our sequence or are we really pulling them together? And um, are we going to be replaced by big data and simulation instead of knowledge? That really worries me. Sharma and I sit there and, oh, you're going to replace knowledge and models with big data? It doesn't even have the right inputs. You know, it, and I've been in projects where they, oh, big data will replace all of this. It's got quietly rolled up after tens of millions of dollars and, and out the door. It's not that big data isn't useful, it's, it's misuse of it. So underlying that is the, the knowledge. I don't want to be the penny side shown while all the funding goes into something that's not actually based on understanding. And, uh, and the mining for minerals is definitely here to stay, but we do have this ongoing problem. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five, four, three, we need a solution quickly, guys. We've got an urgent problem, and we're going to see it now. Oh, by 2030, I have to slash 30% of the energy. I need a solution now. I can't fund that long-term research because it's not going to be in time. No, to me, we need to turn that boat. And it's 2050 target. There's a whole lot of research that's out there we can pull together to form the foundation for what is really the change in the 2040s. So they're fully running by 2050s. That to me, and I'll be a bit of an old guy or dead or something by then, but I'd really like to see that. So I don't want uh, a myth to uphold future excuses. I want reality. So now we get to the beautiful dragon. I googled beautiful dragon and this one came up. <laughs> and um, so let us gather our sequence, okay, to form the mighty dragon of myth and legend but be ours to hold, not someone else's. Let us hold it as a research and technical community. So draw the picture from the earth to you. So connect yourself from the earth, the minerals in the earth to yourself, you're, and to the person, the customer, the consumer. You're all of them, okay? And so is our industry. So you're inside and outside the fence. Alice Clark uses this term. You're in and outside the fence. We are both sides. If we can see both sides, we're more effective. Okay. So now it's new notions. Now you get to get the paper jet and we've got spare paper jets. What are the new notions that you think will take us forward to that totally new industry? So I will stress, if we just change what we're doing now, we will not vaguely meet any of those targets, not vaguely. We will be using more energy. We will need more power stations. <laughs> And th that's not a myth, that's not made up by me. That's just the fact of the amount of energy we use. How are we gonna change that completely? And there are people out there saying, well, it's not possible, but don't worry, we'll say we're going net zero and we'll do an accounting thing and plant some trees and we'll count the Amazon forest into our, we'll buy some of the Amazon forest, we're good. And I'm not actually kidding about that. That's what's gonna happen. I don't wanna see that happen. And whether you, you think this targets are right or not, Actually, processing efficiently and effectively and utilizing our resources wisely, that's very smart. And not having waste and destroying our environment, that's very smart. I'm totally with it. So let's do it. So what are we going to need to get there? 
what are the what are the essential tools or essential essential bits that will build this beautiful dragon? So that's maybe more challenging. Have you got ideas to throw down yet, or do you want to throw them as you go? What I can do is you can throw them down anytime. Why don't we do that? So you've got some time to think about it. And hopefully out in the Zoom world, you guys are thinking about it as well. And I'd like your comments on the chat because we can do it, you know, I, I can blog it out afterwards is to, well, what ideas did come out here? And are we excited by this? Are we excited by the fact that there is, the horse is bolted. So on this, this like the, the climate summit, the horse is bolted. Companies are saying, we're going to achieve it with, with great confidence. And I'm just worried that the 100 million they're going to spend on it is going to be spent on marketing, not on technology. I'm deeply concerned about that. So let's make sure it's technology, guys. Let's make sure it's real. So that's, that's what's really triggered me in this. Because see, I'm all fired up about it. <laughs> so whenever you've got a plane, throw it down. We're going to hook them up here. And I'm going to read some of them. You're always the quickest. It's good. But you're not a very good paper train thrower, or it's not a very good paper plane. Hope you appreciate the sequins on the plane, by the way. For those out in Zoom, well, these are beautifully done by Murray and I with sequins on them. They're going to be a legend in the future, these planes, a legend. They're going to be up in the cabinets up there, the glass cover around them, spotlight. Look what they did on the 8th of April, 2022. Right. Get rid of MPV, spread the... What over the what? Value. The value over time, hundred percent. I love it. Can you want to hook those up? You, you picked up one of mine and my list. NPV prevents us changing the way we do we do work. That's the kind of um, you're know, moving on to a new way of valuing our minds. So a new way of of um, of turning the finances around so that the companies can see the value of completely changing how you do business. So back to the dragon, keep those planes. We've got one, one down. I hope there's some Zoom World planes out there. So to emphasize what I indicated before, we, we are researchers. We're not here to retread old, repave old roads. We should not be repaving old roads. Um, when I receive, I do lots of paper reviews. When I receive a paper that says, I have improved the way or the application of the applying bond work index. It gets the flick instantly. Send it back to the journal and say, I have no interest. I don't care how good the piece of work is. I have no interest because it's locking us into an old paradigm. And I have nothing against bond. He did a great piece of work, but you need to appreciate it was 70 years ago. None of us were here. Great piece of work with a slide rule and a mill and a small mill. We seriously need to have moved on. It's not the future. It's solidly, solidly in the past. Um, so measurement and modeling of current systems is our platform for learning. It's not our destiny. And actually, it's very useful. I've spent 30 years, 35 years understanding current process to figure out what the future might be. And that's what I'm working on. I couldn't figure out the future if I didn't know how the systems work. I need to know how rocks break, how the minerals are liberated, how we truck ore around a mine. You know, how do we recover minerals? It was always amazing to think they're bubble baths that you catch minerals in. Are they smarter ways? Probably, but that's a good bulk way. So that's a learning platform. It shouldn't be our destiny as, as a research community, and it's not going to be our destiny going forward as an industry. So empirical backfitting is not going to get us there. It really has to be applied on the understanding to apply to processes not yet invented. That's what I want to see. It's not even invented and I can, I can model it. So my universal comminution model, unified comminution model I came up with, that was the purpose. We're still trying to get it to work. And I came up with the idea in 2004. But I've learned a huge amount by having the objective, huge amount. And I just learned every year how little I understood, which was amazing. I just got dumber and dumber as I went through my career. I understood less and less. So. Maximizing resource utilization is a, uh, I guess, a byword of mine for a long time. And it captures a lot in it because it says not just the mineral out the ground, but it's our resources, our water, our energy resources, our environment. It's putting them all together. 
But what's underneath there is mineral grain association. And I don't see it in any of our models because it's difficult. Yes, it's difficult, but it's about time we did it. It's all built on the minerals associated in a granular structure in the ground with cracks and fragments and all the rest. We take them out, we want to separate the minerals and keep the, the good bits and the, the clean bits here and the bits we don't want over there. That's what it's all about. We don't even model that. Like, what? You're in an industry, we've been seriously researching, call it 120 years, and we don't model the very thing that's underneath. Yes, there have been attempts at liberation modeling separately, but if you look at a process design, I just measure responses and I plug it into my models. What's the underlying stuff? I've not been able to get funding for that ever. And there's been great work here, but it just doesn't quite can't get over the line because it's done independently of the mineral structure. It's a mathematical construct around it. Um, the best I've seen is Marco Hilden and unfunded and still unfunded. And I'd put all my money onto that and take that path forward. So the mineral structure, we must carry it in there. What's the spatial that becomes temporal fluctuation. So that's the stuff we really do need to carry forward. And experience counts. I, I put great value on the experience I have, but really not dogma. And we hit dogma a lot of this is how it's done. And that's the preconceived notions in the bin. So experience that never tires is experience that's curiosity. And please to dispel myths and laws and please to be disproven. When I'm developing Sunny and I say, this is how it works, Shuja can tell me, no, no, it doesn't. And demonstrate it doesn't. Well, that was a miserable failure of a jet. <laughs> um, can, you can pass it on next row. That's fantastic, because that means we're just spelling the limitations of my previous knowledge. Okay. Oh, excellent throw. I'm waiting for the best jet. Uh... <laughs> so we want to experience with curiosity on top. I didn't pick out who had the best throw yet. <laughs> Fine tuning is jet, well, a good spiral pathway. So back to the bits we really want, what underlies all of this? What is the essence? Is that minerals, the mineral association? So seeing the patterns and linkages, not seeing the sequence on, on their own, sequence. And it takes patience. And I'm going to take a little part at the end of this, what I mean doing. One of my flaws is that I'm too patient. And so I've been pushing along gradually and frustrated and putting this together. And I look back of 25 years of doing that and I think, oh, I made so little progress. But I've been chipping away at all sorts of aspects that are quite difficult. And I'm busy writing models now with Dion and thinking, why didn't I write this 15 years ago when I was more intelligent, much probably then? I need younger people who still know how to do maths. I've discovered I can't do maths anymore. So Replace and, and sew the sequins, replace the misfits, recover the falling bits, it's tough. You do stuff, it's your gem, it's part of your PhD, and then it's, uh, it's not very useful. It's very tough to let go and put it over here and say, actually, this is what I've learned. But you've learned, it's not wasted. Stuff that you can't use is not wasted if you've seriously thought about it, because you've learned what doesn't work. That's amazingly useful. Very difficult to convince a PhD student to that to leave that whole three months work out of their thesis. It's very tough to, to face up to that, but we've got to do a whole lot of that. We must probably have to leave 90% behind, not 5%, okay? This you can maybe read later. These, by the way, you might've picked up, these are thought dumps from Malcolm put together. It's an inspiration thing. It's not a structured <laughs> presentation, but this is one of my favorite photographs ever. So this is a Siddiq Arnorn in the west of Australia. And they chose to erect all the mills in advance and then build a process around it as the, as the mine pit expanded, which means that you have gazillions of government funding behind you because you can't possibly do that economically. But uh, it was amazing. So we were there looking at the site and they put six of these 40 foot diagonals up. And there they were on their foundation. I'd never seen anything like that. And there's a huge, beautiful mill 
and it's completely useless until you link it in. That's why I like a photograph. If you've got that beautiful piece of research, but it doesn't link to anything. I have the best mill in the world, but I have no idea how to link it into the process. I have the best recovery process in the world, but everything must be precisely between uh, 15 and 17 microns for it to work. Well, how do I put it in the process? And we have that problem. I have a all sorting, I have a, a course recovery system, but I need all the particles in this narrow size range. Okay, so you screen out everything that's not in the size range, you've got 10% left. I get amazing recovery out of the 10%. But well, what about the other 90%? And we fall, we fall short all the time on that. And this has been bugging me for years, by the way. So I've been thinking about this for years. So let's not get into, I'll put some examples down here. So let's not get trapped into the, the beautiful idea on its own. If you have the beautiful idea, make sure you have a system to put it into. And that's what I'm proposing here is that, are we brave enough to get into the system to share those beautiful uh, gems that we have? And foundations are fundamental. So my great friend Dion will be applauding from the other end of the Zoom, I hope. If you don't have the foundations and the fundamentals, how are you going to how are you going to design a piece of equipment that hasn't been invented? How are you going to invent it? How are you going to simulate the circuit that you haven't yet invented? Well, you ain't going to do it with backfitted models, are you? So identify the science, but we have to be pragmatic. And I've really tried that. I'm a physicist by training. Pragmatic, I'm out there on a plant understanding the process and um, having the feel for the steam and the noise and the rocks and the sticky mud that's got caught up and the stop the bills. These things have a big influence in the process. You need to understand it as a researcher or you part with some, which is cool. So you understand it as a team. Aha, that's good. So I don't go inventing something that's never going to be any use because I've teamed up with the right people to go as a partnership. And so you look forward to apply the science. Let's apply the science. And uh, so do we have the insights, the curiosity, the courage to move forward on this, this journey and create a vision? Really is about a vision of that will get us there by 2050 and really transform us. And you think about what's our measure of success, how beautiful will our dragon be? So science with a purpose. So every subset is part of a chain. As you can see, I have a very strong theme through here. So there's overlap of the thoughts, but that's kind of different ways of thinking, different angles of thinking about, about those thoughts. So have you even dared to try these uh, outrageous ideas? And we should do in a research institute. We shouldn't be, now you've got to do these five things because we that'll improve what we're doing now. That's not our purpose, okay? And um, looking at the linkages, the sensitivities, can we simulate future potential equipment and say, look, I don't know fully how to build it yet, but if these are its responses, is it useful? And you put in the simulator and say, oh, no, it's not, it makes a 1% difference. It's a beautiful idea, but it ain't gonna make a difference to it. So that's what we, we lack. We lack the ability to predict the thing we haven't yet invented, how it will influence the industry. And let's get our, our brilliance out there. So the self-building, the self-confidence in, in our research staff. So this really is a journey of an expanding mind, as you might have figured out. And that's education. And I, I've just thrown a bunch of stuff here. Um, would it be called future, future minerals? We've got to have a much better idea name than mining engineering or something. People don't want to hear about mining engineering and mineral processing, but future minerals, do we get our smart youth on board? And I feel like I've been in the SMI for a while, but I'm just like this, you just spot some words in there. But actually, when I go out there, the people that don't have the skills to cover the system, I think we're lacking the system. A person operating a plant has no idea how to run control. And then how do they control a mill? Like they have weird ideas on controlling a system and a piece of equipment, they don't know about control and the interaction and the transients and how they interact with each other. It's almost like that's our undergraduate. Now, postgraduate is you might specialize in one area, your fifth year, sixth year of engineering. Now, it'd be like the Swede, you do six years to get an engineering degree. So your first four years, you get this, and then you, you really focus in maybe an area you'll specialize in. So you can, you can operate that area. 
So I think edu I'm sure education is the route. By 10 years time, these people are up and flying who've been through this course. So this is my personal way I've been applying. So do I walk the talk? Um, I think so, in my own little way. So this is just what Malcolm's been doing. To give you an idea of, I've been approaching it over the last, say, 20 years. It's definitely started in my UCT days, and I brought it through, through here. So, that, sorry, that was tomography. So let's look inside the rock. And we've got all the tomography and everything here. We would barely use it because it's quite difficult. And how do we model it? And how do we get it in? We only see a few rocks. But that's the heart of it. What's the mineral association? And then this is the Marco Mineral Association model, just amazing. This is how you can carry it through a system. Mathematically, uh, it's viable on our computers these days, isn't it, Marco? A few minutes to simulate the process. Yeah, yeah, modest marker. Um, this is Gio Piora of Marcus Buono, who was here and invented it with Rajiv when he was here, and the university wasn't that keen to pick it up, so he picked it up. It's now a product. It's, and I'm not just remarketing, it's, it's the idea that we're fracturing a particle, we're measuring the force to fracture. So silk is amazing and wonderful, but it's slow. So it's the most precise measurement we have, short impact load cell to measure strength distribution, but it's precise, but it's slow. This is fast and it measures force and individual particle breakage. And you can gather them all together and get other stuff. So that's one of the companies I got drawn in by Marcus to, to um, join his company there. So that's one of the companies I'm in. This is Shujas, who's got the beautiful red tie on. Um, so this is at the fine end, breaking at the fine end, getting a really good measure of the energy. And this is agnostic to the equipment. It's not for bore mills or crushers or HPGRs or new inventions we got. It's just forced to break a particle. And what's the energy and product size? To me, it really underlies anything. It's agnostic. I can put 200 gram samples in it and get the energy with a confidence of a percent or so, we hope, with our new torque cells. So it talks sensors, but look into the future. That's new characterization. And we've got our colleagues, my colleagues in Germany have one that the, the maximum feed size is 100 micron and going down to 10 micron feed size. So all the way down to fine grinding. And we can characterize the energy and the appearance function for modeling out of something like this. It might not be the ideal machine, but I'm giving it a go. Or Suja, should we say. DM modeling, modeling current mills, mill liner design with my CTTI company. And they might say, well, Malcolm, that's the past. Yes, it is, but it's my foundation for learning. We're going to use it now. There might be beautiful scrubbers in the future or a fine autogenous grinders to supplement other milling. Um, that understanding of the interaction of the energy in a piece of equipment is where unified comminution model triggered. And I got into DM and discovered how useless it was. So 20 years later, we're still trying to make it useful. So I've got two models out there, one happening in the States with Mohammed, one here with Dion, um, trying to, still trying to model the mill from discrete element model outcomes. So it's challenging. Um, education, GCC Academia, GCC is now a foundation based in Germany, interestingly, so in EU. And we're launching next month the education program deliberately called academia. So it's understand what's the under, underlying. So it goes into industry and then into students. Can we all be part of that? So it's, I'm launching that international. And that's my international collaboration at TCC. Have the courage to be out there and, and share your ideas and build a bigger community. This integrated process knowledge developed here, lots of people joined in. It's about taking, it's all about the rock, the journey from what's in situ as you break it up. It's the same rock, hasn't changed. It's still the rock, just little bits. So we actually should know all about it when we look there. And we, we're trying and we're doing geomets, we're doing measurements, but proxies. So when I, my piece of paper crumpled up and in there is proxies. I don't want to ever hear the other word proxies. And apologies to those who are doing a PhD in proxies. It's where we are now, and it's not that it's flawed what you're doing, but the future shouldn't need proxies. We should actually measure the thing that's going to go into the equipment. 
So that's the process knowledge. That's the simulator to carry all information. This integrated process prediction I presented at uh, Complex All Bodies 2018, took it a step further of putting it in a, in a full process, which was here, alternate scenarios of a long mine plan that involved communities stretching out for 50 years, wind powered, only 20% of external power, maybe we can go to naught, 20% um, of the road use. These mineral processing plants are mobile, so every five years or so they move. They're movable, not mobile. That I put up in 2018, and I'm doing it now. I'm building that piece of equipment that's in the middle there to try and make this a reality. I have a nice little video I showed there, but it's been way too much time to show it. And this is the outcome I'm looking at. So a process like this that's completely different in some aspects. So right from the ore side, the mining side, to streams processing, not one processing. So we have this thought, well, we must say one process is cheap. Actually, if we break it up and we can switch units on and off and be more selective, as well, that's hard. Well, no, that's what we've got to do. We can totally change the profile of what we're in. So it could be different mining process. I've got open pits, block K, maybe block K with a difference where it's really well drilled and fragmented so we, we don't draw the waste down with it. We're more controlled about it. Some of you are into that area. Um, here, uh, Nova Mera in Canada is, is drilling, so surgical extraction. So this is uh, um, raised bore mining. So you go down the veins. Could we draw out the most valuable and then afterwards fragment and use bugs to leach the rest of the ore body out? And, and do a dual system around there. Completely different mounting methods maybe, but let's look at the potential outcomes. So these are viable outcomes, pretty much with existing equipment, not quite. So some under a development, but it's shown it actually works, is 11, 12% of the energy. Now that is a big change. That's worth what we're aiming for. Not 11, 12% saving, 11, 12% use of current energy. With higher recoveries, extremely low fines, so we can recover more water. So the secret there is we're not producing slimes we don't need for recovery and just get trapped into a slime stamp, tailing stamp. So that's like a dream to me, but I'm actually doing it. So we can go pre some kind of heat bleach, but we'll prepare so we get much better recovery. Put our deleterious stuff in maybe a satellite pits so there is no dam wall that can break, no seepage. Uh, dry stacking, 65 to 70% of the volume of our waste could go that way. And our tailing dam, 20, 25%. Not fully solved yet, but fines, you can't stop fines being produced when you break a rock, however carefully you break it. So it's still to be addressed. Then you could potentially do something quite different because it's a small percentage of your material. So I'm hopefully walking the talk. I'm, I'm doing all of that mainly for free. So I have five jobs and only one pays me. <laughs> okay. So what are our preconceived notions, our gems to keep and our new notions? And, you know, proxies, PAE, database models, want to get rid of single particle fracture, silk, abrasion test, DM, PEP, these are things I think are fantastic to take with. And new notions, variable capacity, being able to switch a mine on and off overnight, go home, come back in the morning. Impossible, says the industry, but it might be no choice when it costs 100 times the energy cost at night. So that's the summary. I've made sure there's no chance of questions when there's four, but I got you to think during it. So a bit of a chaotic journey, absolutely. Hopefully it's inspired some ideas. You might just think I'm crazier than you thought I was before, but it's, uh, it's, uh, I want to really trigger this. I do think the horse is bolted on this. You know, there is going to be a huge push to meet these climate change targets. Let's make sure that it's real change, not accounting change. Maybe that's the message underneath all of this. And we can ride that horse. There are hundreds of millions of dollars on that horse. 
everyone's betting on that horse there. Let's make sure it's our horse is the real one. Okay. And I'm sure we can tap in a few hundred million. Don't be, don't be shy. You've got to be ambitious. You've got to wear the sequin tie to the boardroom and say, you're going to fund me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You are allowed to ask some questions. Do we have a microphone? Do you have a microphone? Okay. Yeah. Um, there's been quite a bit of chatter on the chat. Um, everyone says great talk and presentation. For instance, one of the questions that was asked is, um, should we also be asking, can we recover without comminution? For example, plasma and direct recovery of metal. This is the first 21st century after all. I just knew someone would want to put me out of a job. <laughs> we would really like to. The comminution you can think is physical, mechanical breakage, or there are other methods, so the electric pulse and so on. There could be direct plasma. All of the others currently are negative energy compared to breaking it with a hammer, interestingly. So I'm not saying no at all. I'm saying that's most probably one of the areas we need to be in. The least fragmentation is what we should aim for. So the least amount of work. All the other equipment I'm seeing developed is can, how much energy can we pump into the small area? And I'm doing exactly the opposite. I'm saying, how little energy can I put into this area? That's the secret to that massive energy saving. There's no magic. It's how little energy. So when people are thinking alternate, you've got to put it in the process. The sequence has to fit into the dragon of how do I put it on the site? What are these big sticky rocks coming through the process? Or do I need to de-sticky them? Sort it. I've got a dry process. Oh, it comes out wet. You can't have a dry process. No, no, I'm going to put it through a scrubber, clean the fines out, and I'm going to put it through a dry process. So not quite answering the question, but they're on the agenda. They, they need to be on the agenda. It's access to the mineral is the key. It's all in a big solid block of rock. You need to get to the little grains. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, thanks, Malcolm. Uh, an exciting talk. Uh, many of the things you speak about in terms of future research uh, involve uh, a lot of time spent on the res on the fundamental research. But what do you think of the current uh, funding structure? in terms of research being uh, funded by industry. Um, a lot of it is more short term. And would that support um, the ideas of the long-term research that you propose? Thanks. That's exactly the point. That's the going into the boardroom with this tie on because it's not going to get us there. So you're correct. It's not going to get us there, no chance. So, I mean, the classic one to say is to quote the first man on the moon. In the 1960s, hadn't been into space, and 69 and man on the moon. That's nine years. It was actually eight years. Can't this industry change in eight years, this 2030? And we can with the hundreds of millions. They put billions into it. And with that view, I'm not telling you must do this research, Musa, and you must do this model and that model. No. We put together the group that we have faith in, and you map the, the tools we need and the path at the same time. So the tools are not separate. The sequins are not on their own. You have to consistently build that beautiful dragon as you go, so they have a purpose. So it's not just we all go and do fundamental research for 10 years and come back and say, we've got some nice stuff. No, we keep building it all the time. You fly, you're on that flight path, you know where you're going. You can demonstrate where you're going. So you will be held accountable, but not, oh, you need to do this piece of research and that, I need a little bit. So there will be desperate need to improve where we're at to keep going before we put the new stuff and that's going to exist. So this is basically on top of it. And it also affects how the government funds us. We, we get nailed by not being funded by the government. So my research I'm doing is funded externally by EU, not by Australia. It's embarrassing. I'm here and I have my companies in other countries funded by other governments because I, I will not get funding here. <laughs> I'm starting to try. So we're starting with some company, funding companies 
five years down the road before we think we even stand a chance. And what's it on? It's on this energy force. <laughs> It's not on research and mining, it's on the energy baton. It's not even mining funding. It's not academic funding. So I find that interesting for me. Anyway, that's been my journey. <laughs> so it's a pertinent question. Yes. Uh, thanks, Malcolm. I love that. That's uh, an interesting analogy with putting a man on the moon. Um, and when, when we look at the mining industry, and putting a man on the moon is a very discreet target and, and they knew exactly what they wanted. And I suspect I know the answer might be something about carbon emissions reduction, but if we were to undertake an intense exercise, what should be our very discreet target or objective? I think I'm gonna deliberately avoid that because I think we should work out what that objective is. You're absolutely right, because that gave the focus. The obvious focus is this climate change objective, the net zero. And I think it's the one we can, we can use to get us where we want to be. But I think in each of our heads, we actually have a different target. So, but we can use the bolted horse to take us there. Is that a fair answer? Because that's not actually my target, <laughs> but it's my conduit. We should be honest about where we're going to go, but if we can say we're going here and it will achieve this, then we can get the backing. But we're going to achieve a hell of a lot more because if we, under, if we underscored like this, how much will you achieve? So the man on the moon is actually a very good one. We have GPS, we have solid state uh, processes because they did all that research for the man on the moon. And that's what's going to come out of this. We are going to develop them the techniques that will genuinely take us forward if you if you have this big push and putting a man on the moon is completely pointless of course but that wasn't the point it it was an it's an aspirational and with us i don't want to say that one's pointless but it's that target is what will get us there it's the carriage that'll take us there and that's probably the the most honest answer i can give on that. <laughs> Thank the you. man in the braces. Man in the braces has a question. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, he has a privileged position because he's got braces on others. It's meant to be turned around so you can see the audience. See. Sorry, Malcolm. I really appreciated your final answer there because this that the whole concept around net zero by 2050, when you start to unpack it, you, you start to ask some real questions about it. But as a quick and easy and pithy target, it's useful. It's useful. Um, but if we only if we aim for net zero by 2050, I don't think we will achieve what we need to achieve. So the actually the objective is not net zero. It's the carriage to take us there. Yeah. And we need to be honest to ourselves and the industry about that. And it, it's the same as the the conversation around ESG. So I mean, it's, it's a subset of sustainability. Yes. Our purpose is sustainability hmm. and global sustainability. All of these are ways to be able to communicate that. But we need to think deeper about, okay, so what does it actually mean? Um, and the, the, the risk at the moment is we're using ESG to talk about E instead of for environmental as a holistic view, we're using it for emissions. So if you talk to most people about ESG, they're talking about emissions. Hmm. And social is around community investment. That, that's a really small part. It's very small. Um, so, so these are useful terms, but as, as a sustainability or sustainable minerals institute, I think we have to think deeper about global sustainability and all the other pieces. So all I want to say, I agree with you. I think it's a useful construct, but we've got to deep, think deeper. Yeah, we can use it, and the, the, it's a it's a KPI. A single KPI can be give you the opposite to what you want. So go very careful of that, but we can use it as a the carriage to take us forward. I don't like KPIs at all, by the way. I always refuse to fill them in on my whatever um, annual reviews and things. I don't do KPIs. So they, if we have that image and we can drive that, and and the industry is is aware, what we're offering is much more. But we can achieve these needs, these targets on the way. I think we'll have a happy industry in both ways and a society. Yeah. Very supportive of it. <laughs>